Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I'm coming to you today from my office for with our midweek video for this week. Um, I do have a bit of a cold. I don't know if you can uh, tell by the way my voice sounds, but um, I have been kind of struggling with that here a bit lately. So uh, pardon me or forgive me in advance uh, if that does bother me some uh, during the making of this video. It is currently Tuesday, November 16. This video will be released on the morning of Thursday, November 18. And we're glad that you've chosen to uh, watch this video. And we want to welcome you to our YouTube channel here, Grace Life Bible on YouTube. If you haven't already done so, we'd like to seriously ask you to consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell so that you can stay current with the ministry here, whether we go live on Sunday morning from the assembly building or whether it's the content that we're releasing and producing here midweek. Um, as we go about our uh, daily lives, so to speak. I want to remind you about our featured book for the month of November. Our featured book for this month is my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. And this book is about uh, the life and career and ministry of Bollinger. It deals with uh, his uh, movement away from what I would consider to be a mid-Acts dispensational point of view to an Acts 28 viewpoint. And it also is the only place I'm aware of in print that deals with the postscript theory on Romans uh, 16, 25, and 26, and how that relates to the Acts 28 position. So there's original analysis in here, original research. You're not going to want to miss that. You're going to want to pick this up and check it out. So if you're looking for a way to support the, help support the ministry, please consider doing this. I'll leave a link to the um, where you can order this book direct from the publisher, Dispensational Publishing House, in the description under this video. also want to remind you about our Rumble channel. We established this as an alt text site to our YouTube channel, should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt text sites, we'd encourage you to check this out and subscribe to us here on Rumble as well. Currently, I'm uploading the two messages from Sunday morning and then the midweek content like this uh, video that I'm making here to the Rumble channel. And we are up 100 to 160. That's up five or six from where we were at last week at this time. So we appreciate that. Last week, I made a video talking about the two streams of Bibles and whether or not the two streams of Bibles paradigm for preservation slash transmission is correct. And I talked about how um, the standard model that you'll find in pro King James literature and teaching has been the two streams. I talked about how I accepted the two streams view uh, in sort of an uncritical way that I did not uh, apply any kind of a Berean test, if you will, to the two streams model, and I just accepted it as true, that those who were teaching it, propagating it, writing about it, preaching about it, etc., um, had had looked into it and that it was established. Well, when I looked into things, I realized that that wasn't necessarily the case. And in the last video, we focused on two examples. I used an example from Mark 1-2 and from Colossians 1-14 in both the Gothic Bible and the Syriac Peshitta to talk about how there are um, non-traditional readings in those two verses in the Gothic Bible and the Syriac Peshitta, and how no King James advocate, no pro, no King James Bible believer would accept those readings from a modern version or the critical text, yet there they are in the pure stream, so-called pure stream Bibles. And so I told you that I think that the, the pure stream or sorry the two streams model is not accurate. I don't think that it holds the test, passes the test of scrutiny. And I don't I, I don't think it's helpful therefore to continue to think about the matter using a model, using a paradigm of discussion or teaching that just upon further investigation and discussion just doesn't really seem to pass the test that you would want it to, particularly accuracy, etc. Um, there's just a lot of problems with it. Now, I also gave you some homework last time, and I commended to you and left in the description for the video from last week my playlist on the two streams of Bibles model of transmission, its origin and accuracy. And I said, if you want more information, if you want to go deep into what I was talking about last week, then I commended this playlist to you. And I'm going to include this again this week in the description for this video as well as well as the notes that go along with it. Now, I know some of you are video watchers and you'll watch the videos. Others of you don't have time to watch the videos, but you would read the document, you would read the notes. So you have a, a choice there of what you'd like to do. 
the ideal thing to do would be to take the notes and have them in front of you while you watch or listen to the videos so that you can get all the explanation and things that I have to say. Now, I do want to just go through the table of contents here. So these, the, the content that I'm covering was taught originally from May 12th to June 16. And then I taught one on September 8th. And this was all from two years ago in 2019. So here's the playlist or the contents that you will encounter if you want to go deep into this. And what we're going to do here is just scratch the surface again. Lesson 85 was on normal transmission and the stream of transmission. Lesson 87 was on the Gothic Bible. Lesson 88 was on the Peshitta. Again, both of those are the two things that we talked about here, except I devoted entire lessons to those where I just talked for maybe 10 or 15 minutes uh, last week in the video. Then we have the Old Latin versus the Latin Vulgate Dichotomy in Lesson 89. Then we look at where the two streams came from in Lesson 90 and the Seventh-day Adventism of Benjamin J. Wilkinson in his book, um, uh, I almost got the title, Our Authorized Bible Vindicated. And then we looked at how J.J. Ray plagiarized Wilkinson and moved Wilkinson's ideas forward in Lesson 91 into the Acts 2 Fundamental Baptist Movement where then it was picked up on by Ruckman and uh, by David Otis Fuller and others that then moved the two streams of Bibles forward into the mainstream, if you will, of, of King James onlyism in the 1960s and 70s. OK, so we talked about that in Lesson 91. And then then we talked about, folks, what I think is the and we looked at the plagiarism, I should say, also in 1991. There's really issues here, guys that you're going to want to look into more deeply than I'm going to cover them in the video from last week or this week. And when, J, when uh, Benjamin J. Wilkinson um, embraced the two streams model and he was criticized by a fellow Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist, he took refuge in the doctrine and uh, the spirit of prophecy of Ellen G. White, the great prophetess of Seventh-day Adventism. Now, I'm not making any of this up. All of this is documented here <coughs> in Lesson 90 and 91. So you're not going to want to miss that content. I'm not going to cover it here unless I get requests to do that. I mean, I, I would consider doing it, but as of right now, I'm not going to cover that in this video. And then we have Lesson 92, overstating the case for the critical text. And I'm going to share some of that with you in this particular lesson. And then Lesson 93, the question of perpetual preservation and textual mobility. And we look there, it's more detail about what Gail Ripplinger said and the Gothic Bible and the Cambridge history of the Bible. So there's a lot here for you to consider, all right? Now, I said last time that in this week, I was going to talk about what I think is the more correct model. So if the two streams of Bibles model is not correct, if there's errors in it, if its origin is, is sketchy, which it is, it has its origin in uh, Seventh-day Adventist doctrine and the spirit of prophecy. Again, <clears throat> not making that up. You're going to want to check that out for yourself. Test me, do the brand test, look into it for yourself, lesson 90 and 91. You're not going to want to just take my word for it, which I don't like anyway. I, I cannot stand when teachers of things just teach things in such a way that you just have to take their word for it. And they don't show you their documentation. They don't show you where they got information from. And you just sort of have to trust that they're going to give you the information. I've come to realize, um, especially when dealing with uh, pro King James literature, you know, Ronald Reagan said, trust, then verify. I say verify, then trust. If I can't verify what's being said, I'm very skeptical of it, <clears throat> and I'm very slow to trust it. So as we think about an alternative model, what would an alternative model be? What might it look like to explain how preservation slash transmission occurred? Okay. So I want to look at a couple things from the notes. And the first thing I want to look at is from Lesson 85, Normal Transmission, the Stream of Transmission. Okay. So I'm going to read a few things here. You can follow along as I go through this, and then uh, we'll go from there. So in Lesson 84, we continued our discussion of normal transmission by considering the four controlling factors <clears throat> identified by Dr. William Pickering in the identity of the New Testament text. That is this book right here, the identity of the New Testament text. This is volume four. This is the most up-to-date volume that you can get of Pickering's work on this topic. I know many of you probably have the old one from like 1977. Um, all that information is in the updated volume, but there is plenty and tons more information in the new volume that you might want to look at. Okay, So according to Pickering, he identifies what he calls normal transmission 
And there are four controlling factors that he identifies for a normal transmission. Number one, for the transmission to be normal, whoever's transmitting the text had to have access to the autographs. Number two, they had to have a proficiency in the source language, which in this case would have been Greek. Number three would be the strength of the church. What was the church like? What were the churches like in that area? And number four, what is their attitude towards the text? Okay. <clears throat> so in lesson 84, we applied the four controlling factors to the historical and textual facts and observed that transmission was both normal and abnormal. Okay. Now, if you're a Bible-believing person, you should expect to find two things, right? You should expect to find preservation and you should expect to find corruption because the Word of God would teach you to think about those things. So I understand where the two streams came from. It came from that sort of very sort of basic generalistic idea. The problem is, is that when you look in the facts and you start sifting through the data, it's far more murky than the simple, than the simple two streams view um, would lead somebody to believe. And then the problem is this. When somebody embraces that view and then somebody comes along with some facts that they don't know what to do with, they, they run the risk of having their faith in the preserved Bible overthrown. And that's what I'm trying to avoid through the teaching of these lessons. Okay, So normal transmission according to Pickering. He said, quote, on page 110, In some, I believe <coughs> that the evidence clearly favors that interpretation of history of the text that seems that sorry that sees the normal transmission of the text as centered in the Aegean region. I call it the Aegean Rim, the, the rim around the Aegean Sea, the area that was best qualified from every point of view to transmit the text from the very first. Now let's just think about that for a minute. The majority of the Pauline epistles are sent to churches in Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Greece along the Aegean Rim. They're the recipients of the majority of the original documents to the New Testament. They are sent to churches and individuals that are in the Aegean Rim, okay? Well, in the Aegean Rim, what language are they speaking? They're speaking Greek, okay? The churches are strong there. They're the most strong churches because they're the ones that are established directly by the ministry of the Apostle Paul, okay? So that area is best qualified by every standard to transmit the text from the very first. The result of that normal transmission is the Byzantine text type. In every age, including the 2nd and 3rd centuries, it has been the traditional text. So then I claim the New Testament text had a normal transmission, namely the fully predictable spread and reproduction of reliable copies of the autographs from the, ver from the earliest period down through the history of transmission <coughs> until the availability of printed text brought an end to that, uh, brought copying by hand to an end. So what Pickering is saying there is that the traditional Byzantine text is the one that meets the qualifications of normal transmission. It's It only makes sense when you think about who wrote the New Testament documents, where they were sent, who they were sent to, what kind of churches those were, who was in those churches, and did they have access and proficiency in the source language to be able to make Auto, to be able to make reasonable copies of the original autographs. Folks, let's face it, the first century Christians, the first century Bible-believing Pauline Christians did not need to be textual critics. They just had to be faithful copyists. That's all they had to be. They had the text, they received it as it was in truth, the Word of God, and they immediately set about making copies of that text. Okay, That would be normal transmission. Abnormal, let's talk about that. <laughs> Turning now to the abnormal transmission, it no doubt commenced right along with the normal. The apostolical writings themselves contain strong complaints and warnings against, the heret against heretical and malicious activity. As Christianity spread and began to make an impact on the world, not everyone accepted it as good news. Opposition of various sorts arose. Certain it is that the church fathers who wrote during the second century complained bitterly about the deliberate alterations to the text perpetuated by heretics. Large sections of the extant writings of the early church fathers are precisely and exclusively concerned with combating heretics. It is clear that during the second century, and possibly already in the first, 2 Corinthians 2.17, 2, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, such persons produced <coughs> many copies of the New Testament writings and incorporated their alterations. The result 
was a welter of variant readings to confuse the uninformed and mislead the unwary. Such a scenario was totally predictable. If the New Testament is in fact the word of God, then both God and Satan must have had lively interest in its fortunes. The, uh, to approach the textual criticism of the New Testament without taking due account of that interest is to act irresponsibly. So what Pickering is saying is that the believing viewpoint, the viewpoint of faith would say that you should expect preservation and you should expect corruption. You should expect normal transmission by believing people and you should expect abnormal transmission by those who have ill intent towards the text. Okay. So when judged in light of Pickering's four controlling factors for normal transmission, the evidence does not point in the direction of Egypt as the propagator of the pure form of the New Testament text. Again, quoting from Pickering here, putting it all together, what are Egypt's claims upon our confidence? Frankly, it seems to me to be virtually impossible that a faithful, high quality transmission of the New Testament text could have taken place in Egypt. It simply lacked the necessary qualifications. Besides, <coughs> the proof is in the pudding. Each of the early manuscripts that is assigned to the Alexandrian text type is itself a poor copy and demonstrably so. Not only they, not only that they disagree among themselves to an ex not only that, excuse me, they disagree among themselves to an astonishing extent. Not to mention the hundreds, perhaps thousands of times they disagree as a group with the rest of the world. Okay. Folks, this is this this is a well-reasoned presentation of an argument based upon biblical presuppositions. Okay. The transmission of the text was normal and it occupied and it occurred, excuse me, in the majority text of the Aegean Rim, otherwise known as the Byzantine text type. Okay. Now, what Pickering does is he says there is one stream of transmission. Just one, not two, okay? And then he gives reasons for this. <clears throat> so I'm going to explain this. Now then, what sort of picture may we expect to find in the surviving witness on the assumption that the history of the transmission of the New Testament text was predictably normal or predominantly normal? We may expect a broad spectrum of copies showing minor differences due to copying mistakes, but all reflecting one common tradition. The simultaneous existence of abnormal transmission in the earliest centuries would result in a sprinkling of copies, helter-skelter, outside of the mainstream. This would look something like figure C. And this is from page 113 again of the identity of the New Testament text. So if you follow my mouse here, my cursor, these cones, everything inside these cones represents what he calls normal transmission. Okay. Then he identifies what he considers to be irresponsible transmission and fabricated transmission. And you notice you have Vaticanus and Sinaiticus here in the fourth century, right? So what he's saying here by this diagram is that there's only one stream of transmission, not two. There's not two streams, there's one stream. You have the pure stream coming down here, representative of the traditional text, the Byzantine majority, the Byzantine text type, again, Words I'm using simultaneously and interchangeably, they could all be individually parsed out if we wanted to do that, and maybe that's a video for another day. But then notice, outside of the mainstream of transmission, you have eddies, what Pickering calls eddies. You have swirling pools of water <clears throat> that are cut off not only from the mainstream of transmission, but also from each other. So Aleph and B are their own pool. The papyri up here are their own pool. Uh, Alexandrinus is its own pool. So they're not only cut off from the mainstream of normal transmission, but they are also cut off from each other. And imagine a, a river flowing now where you have the main body of the river flowing. And then along the banks, you have swirling eddies or pools of water that are not only cut off from the main flow of the river, but they're also cut off from each other. OK, and that is Pickering's point. He's saying that the the eddies, the manuscripts that comprise these eddies, not only are outside of the mainstream, but they also are cut off from each other. So to say that any of these eddies, when taken together, form a monolithic stream of transmission is to actually misrepresent the facts. 
and it is actually to it is actually to really hide from view how aberrant and how divergent the manuscripts in these eddies are not only from each other but more importantly from the mainstream of normal transmission okay now i understand you're gonna have to have your thinking cap on and you're gonna have to work with me here okay but pickering pickering's model says there's one stream in the mainstream you have the vast majority of the extant manuscripts that comprise the byzantine text type they may have slight differences and variations from each other, but they are substantively the same. And all of those in the main body here of transmission form a monolithic text type when these swirling in the edges not only differ from the mainstream, but they differ from each other. Okay, so <clears throat> the manuscripts within the cones represent the normal transmission. To the left, I have plotted some possible representatives of what might might what we might style as irresponsible transmission of the text the copiers produced poor copies through incompetence or carelessness but did not make deliberate changes so that would be this part up here these uh papyri okay then he says to the right i have plotted some possible representatives of what we might style fabricated transmission of the text the scribes made deliberate changes to the text for whatever reasons producing fabricated copies not true copies I am well aware that the manuscripts plotted on the figure both contain both careless and deliberate errors in different proportions, okay? So that any classification such as I attempt here must be relative and gives a distorted picture. Still, I venture to insist that ignorance, carelessness, officiousness, and malice all left their mark upon the transmission of the New Testament text, and we must take account of them in any attempt to reconstruct the history of that transmission. Later, <clears throat> Pickering explains how his diagram in figure C fares when compared against the extant manuscript evidence. What we find upon consulting the witnesses is just such a picture. We have the majority text, Aland, or the traditional text, Bergen, dominating the stream of transmission with a few individual which, uh, witnesses going in idiosyncratic ways. We have already seen the notion of, quote, text types and recensions as defined by Hort and used by his followers is gratuitous. Epps' notion of streams fares no better. There is just one stream with a number of small eddies, a circular movement of water counter to the main current, causing a small whirling pool along the edges. When I say the majority text dominates the stream, I mean it is represented in about 95% of the manuscripts. <clears throat> so Pickering is making an outstanding argument here based on scriptural presuppositions, based upon logic and mathematical probability about this issue, okay? And then he gets into <clears throat> a lot of detail here. I just commend to you this page um, because I actually want to go ahead now to page 68, okay? So everything there that I just said is based upon a, an analysis of Pickering's work, okay? So here we are. Page 68, here's the cones. And I actually want, bear with me, I apologize. Here's what I want. The biggest problem with the two streams model of transmission. <coughs> My biggest problem with the two streams of Bibles model of transmission is that it gives the critical text and modern versions more credit than they deserve. Two streams charts, two streams charts, diagrams, and literature leave the readers with the impression that there is an unbroken line of systematic and sequential corruption structuring all the way back to the earliest centuries of church history in the following reverse order. So this is in the reverse order. So in the 20th and 21st centuries, we have modern versions. Then we have the UBS and Nesselon Greek texts in the 20th century. The revised version of 1881, the Westcott and Hort text of 1881. And by the way, that is a real, legitimate, authentic 1881 Westcott and Hort Greek text there. The Dewey Reims, et cetera, going all the way back to Alexandria, Egypt. Okay, <coughs> Is this really the case? So is it really the case that there is an unbroken line of systematic corruption going all the way back. 
systematic and sequential corruption. Is it true that that is in fact the case? Okay, I submit that the answer is an emphatic no. We need to uh, we need to judge the so-called corrupt stream outlined above based upon the three scriptural principles for identifying the preserved text in history. Recall the following from lessons sixty nine and eighty one. Quote: When approached from a believing viewpoint, a study of transmission is a study of the history of preservation. Once again, our job as believers is not to reconstruct the text as though it had been lost. Rather, our job is to allow the scriptures to be our guide in identifying the text that God has preserved from generation to generation. Okay, now, if you look at the scriptures, there are three principles that will help us do this. Okay. So in all of these lessons, and by the way, those lessons are from, from this Generation Forever class, that's where I'm getting this from. <coughs> the first is multiplicity of copies. In lessons 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, we study the process and people of preservation of both the Old and New Testaments. In doing so, we observe that God's design was to preserve his word in a multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that are just as authoritative as the original. Therefore, we ought to observe in history a collection of manuscripts that are plenteous, that means many of them, Byzantine majority, in substantive agreement with each other regarding doctrinal content, Byzantine majority, despite not possessing verbatim identicality of wording, Byzantine majority. Second, available and accessible. This principle was covered in Lesson 55. The preserved text would not only exist in a multiplicity of copies, but, there would be, but they would be available to God's people to study, copy, believe, translate, and preach from. They would not be hidden under a rock, buried in the sand, or in an inaccessible library or monastery. They're going to be out amongst the people of God. They're going to be out amongst the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is going to have them available. They're going to have them accessible. They're going to be able to get their hands on them. They're going to be able to copy them, preach from them, teach from them, transmit them, and do everything that you would expect God's people to do with God's word. <clears throat> and third, it's a text that's in use. A third biblical hallmark of the preserved text would be use by God's people for generations. God's word was preserved through the dynamic of people handling it, not in one copy sitting on a bookshelf for 500 to 1,000 years, far away from God's people who are actually doing the work of the ministry. That is not the way God preserves his word. He preserves his word by it being in the hands of Bible-believing people, and those people are charged then with the responsibility of executing God's purpose. So, the proposed corrupt stream identified above containing critical text supporting modern versions fails on all three counts to pass the test of Scripture. Number one, it has few manuscript witnesses that substantively disagree with each other. Remember Pickering said their eddies that are cut off not only from the mainstream of transmission, but from each other, okay? Number two, its principal manuscripts were not accessible or available to believers throughout the dispensation of grace. That's a fact. I don't care what your position is on textual criticism. That's a fact. The two principal manuscripts of the critical text, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, were not available and accessible to believing people throughout the history of the dispensation of grace, and number three, given the lack of availability, they certainly were not copied and or used by Bible-believing people during the church age. Okay, so the modern critical text then was a 19th century creation of textual critics based upon the primary witness of two Greek codices, Vaticanus B and Sinaiticus Aleph. These two codices disagree with each other in over 3,000 places, Oh, in, in 3,000 places in the Gospels alone, many of which are substantive. Moreover, they were inaccessible to the body of Christ throughout the dispensation of grace because they, not know, were, not, they were not known to exist until the 15th century in the case of Vaticanus and the 19th century in the case of Sinaiticus, respectively. Lastly, they have no history of ever having been used or copied by the body of Christ. So, no amount of subjective preference can obscure the fact that they are poor copies, objectively so. They were so bad that no one could stand to use them, and so they survived physically 
but had no children since no one wanted to copy them. So here's my point to say that these these things may that these things form a monolithic stream of corruption isn't true. And it misrepresents how bad they are. Not only how bad they are, but how bad the modern critical text is. Okay, so if you look at my next point, the critical text is a Frankenstein text. Some people are going to be offended by that. So it's a Frankenstein text that was cobbled together by text critics in the 19th century using a collect an eclectic method. Now, listen, no member of the body of Christ had ever seen such a text, much less used the text like the one printed by Westcott and Horton, 1881. That one right there. Okay. A publication of the critical text was the fruit of lower criticism's application of Enlightenment rationalism upon the biblical text. <clears throat> Therefore, to assert that the critical text and its resultant modern versions are part of, quote, the stream of corruption stretching all the way back to Nicene antiquity is to overstate the case and to give the critical text more credit than it deserves. While there was corruption of the New Testament text, to be sure, throughout the history of the dispensation of grace, such corruption was random, isolated, and not, not monolithic, not systematic and or sequential, as has been argued by two streams advocates. To say this is give, to, to adopt this model is giving, is giving the modern critical text more credit than it deserves. This is a 19th century creation. No member of the body of Christ ever saw a text like this or used a text like this until this was printed in 1881. <clears throat> now, there's a bunch of technical stuff here again from Pickering. It's all great stuff. I'm skipping it for the sake of time. Okay. In short, there are examples of corruption to be sure, but there is no stream of corruption as has, as has been asserted by two streams advocates. The critical text reflected in modern versions did not exist, as I just said a moment ago, until the 19th century when it was created by text critics. So to place these modern creations in the stream of transmission along with the Latin Vulgate and even the Catholic Reims New Testament of 1582 serves to mask the monster created by text critics in the 19th century. Now, this is a portion, guys, of a meme that's popular on Facebook and social media about almost all modern versions, including the NIV, remove these 16 verses. Okay? Now, look, I went and I got an original copy of the Reims Bible from 1582, and I checked all of these. Okay? Every one of these verses that is missing from the critical text and the modern versions, every one of those verses is in a Reims New Testament. Okay? It's in a Reims New Testament. Now, some of you are going to lose your mind, okay? I'm not saying you should go buy a Reims and use a Reims. There are still issues with the Reims, okay? Now, but textually, you would be better off using a Reims than you would be a modern version, textually. Because of what's in it versus what's left out of it. Now, I have a whole lesson in the From This Generation Forever class. Lesson 150, the Reims New Testament assessing its influence upon the King James Bible. If you don't think that the Reims influenced the King James, you are mistaken of the facts. Okay? <clears throat> this particular lesson on the Reims and its relationship to the King James <clears throat> is 30 pages. 30 pages of meticulous documentation showing how the Reims, the King James has more in common with the Reims than it does with the modern critical text or modern versions. So to relegate the Reims now wholly to the stream of corruption as though it has nothing to do with what ends up being in a King James Bible, is not only factually incorrect, it's giving the critical text more credit than it deserves. So if you want to know more about that, you can go really deep here on Lesson 150. And also, I might add, not just Lesson 150, <clears throat> but in this class, 
I did five or six lessons on the reams and talking about the reams in detail. So we have uh, lesson 150, lesson 149, lesson 148, lesson 147, where we assess the text of the reams. And then I believe there are more lessons here. Lesson 156, understanding the origin and aims of the reams. So there are about seven or eight lessons just on the reams, New Testament, that you're going to want to check out if you want to know. But back to the point, okay? <clears throat> For these reasons, I believe the two streams of Bibles model of transmission inadvertently strengthens the pro-modern version side of the translation debate. This is accomplished by hiding how dissimilar the critical text and modern versions are from anything that came before, including the Catholic Vulgate and the Reims New Testament. One reason is because the two streams model was not based upon an objective evaluation of textual data, but upon the conjectural doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Benjamin J. Wilkinson, check out Lesson 90 and 91. So what is my model? Now, I'm not good at graphics. It's getting dark in here. I'm not good at graphics. So I have it written out, and I want you to visualize what I'm calling transmission turnpike. Transmission turnpike, a highway. Okay? <clears throat> so based upon the historical and textual evidence we, we have considered, if one were to diagram the stream of transmission, it would resemble a highway transmission turnpike, if you will, stretching from the first century to the 21st and beyond into the ages to come, remaining squarely on the highway and thereby safely traversing time and history are the Greek manuscripts of the Byzantine majority, as well as translations, patristic quotations, and lectionaries that are in substantive doctrinal agreement with each other despite not possessing verbatim wording. This mass of text, this mass of textual witnesses preserved and transmitted the pure text of Scripture. <clears throat> you can go back to page six to see those factors. Okay, so that would be what we would expect. It's plenteous. There's many of them. By the way, the lectionaries, based upon the data I've looked at, there's not one single lectionary that would support a uh, the critical text. In addition. We, would, we should expect to find some textual witnesses driving with wheels on both the highway and the shoulder. So you've got those witnesses that are squarely on the highway, okay? They're in substantive doctrinal agreement with each other, even though they don't possess necessarily verbatim wording, but they all are part of that mainstream of transmission, that normal transmission that are moving the text forward generation after generation. But then what we're going to find is what I'm calling mixed texts, okay? Texts that are driving part on the shoulder, part on the road, okay? These witnesses are best viewed as mixed texts in that they contain pure readings as well as corrupted ones to varying degrees. <clears throat> While they may have begun squarely on the highway, they have drifted to the shoulder over time. Therefore, we would expect to find manuscripts in this category traveling with varying degrees of recklessness, i.e. differing amounts of purity and corruption. To which I would say the Gothic, the Peshitta, the Old Latin, and the Vulgate are examples of mixed texts. <coughs> Lastly, Bible believers should expect to encounter what I'm calling Fords. So for all you Ford fans, I apologize. Okay. Fords, or found on dead manuscripts, littering the ditches of history. These manuscripts not only disagree with the readings of the majority, but they also disagree with each other. So these would be Pickering's eddies, the swirling bodies of water that are cut off from the mainstream, <clears throat> but also differ from each other. I'm calling them Fords on my transmission turnpike illustration. <clears throat> these manuscripts not only disagree with the readings of the majority, but they also disagree with each other. They're the left for dead manuscripts of history that have no evidence no evidence of ever having been copied or used by the body of Christ. Their existence in the presence is due to their intentional abandonment by the believing church in the past. The believing church in the past abandoned them to the ditch. They were never copied. They were never used. The only reason they survive is because they were abandoned. They were left for dead on the side of the road, so to speak. 
It is these discarded vehicles or manuscripts along the ditches of transmission turnpike that have been revitalized by modern textual critics and foisted upon the body of Christ as the original text of Scripture. And here you would have Aleph, uh, Sinaiticus, B, Alexandria, um, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, <laughs> and some of the papyri. Which, by the way, I should do a video sometime on the witness of the early papyri and whether or not the papyri all support the um, modern uh, critical text or whether or not any of them support the Byzantine text, because I think you would be surprised uh, to learn some information about that. So, folks, I've been yammering on now for 40 minutes. I try to keep these videos short, but this one, there was sort of no avoiding it. The two streams model is not true. <clears throat> not only is it not true factually, it hides from view how bad, how unlike anything that came before it, the modern critical text is. So for me, I'm abandoning the two streams. I think Transmission Turnpike is a better illustration, a better model for understanding how this happened. Now, for those of you who are like, well, you didn't convince me, I would simply say, then you need to circle back and look at the, uh, the rest of the information. What I have done here in the video from last week and this week is just give you highlights of this and to get you to think, get you to think about the matter, to think about the topic, because <clears throat> to me, I don't understand why critics of the King James or modern critical text advocates have not came down on the two streams of my two streams of Bibles with a sledgehammer. They haven't. And I sit here and I say, why haven't they done that? And I think it's because from my, after my own analysis, my own thinking about this, my own evaluation, I think it's because the two streams is actually helping them. It's actually helping them. It's helping them by putting out the idea that there's a monolithic stream here that reaches all the way back into antiquity that is not in line with the facts. So folks, I got to wrap this video up. Let me just say, I am releasing, <clears throat> listen, jump the gun there a little bit. I want you to be persuaded in your own mind on this. I don't want you to believe anything just because I say it. But if you're going to disagree, you need to have a factual, textual reason for not agreeing. Okay? Those things I would love to discuss. I'd love to have a conversation about this. It seems, though, that a lot of folks don't want to enter into a discussion about this, and I'm not totally sure why. But that's my viewpoint. <clears throat> that's what I've taught and I've laid that out again in much more detail, not in, in the From This Generation Forever class and in the document. All these notes <coughs> are going to be shared in the link or in the description for this video. And before you go, I want to remind you, I, we are re-releasing on this channel, on our YouTube page here, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 a.m., we are re-releasing the Grace History Project. There'll be three videos a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 a.m. If you've never gone through the Grace History Project and you've never checked out the his church history from the point of view of Pauline truth, you're going to want to do that. You need to check it out. You need to invite other people into that conversation. You're going to want to check out From This Generation Forever. Okay. Also, last Sunday and From This Generation Forever, two days ago, I did a video on the decision to translate where we looked at the very moment when the idea was floated for the King James Bible and what the response was of Reynolds, Barlow, and King James and what the dynamics of that decision were. You don't want to miss that video. That's an exciting video. You're going to want to check that out. And again, just a reminder here again about my podcast with my wife, Becky, uh, the Just Grace It podcast with Brian and Becky Ross. We're trying to do one of these a week. And also a reminder, Brian, you about our featured book for the month of November, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bullinger. There's a ton of content. Make sure you like this channel, subscribe, ring the alarm bell, like this video, share this video. Let's get some conversation going out there on this, on this particular topic. And before I go, 
If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you have never relied exclusively on his shed blood for your sin upon the cross, his burial and his resurrection from the dead as the only total complete payment for your sin, you need to trust the finished work of Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for forbearing and enduring to the end. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. We will see you next time. Thanks.